Hey guys, thanks for joining us on the Best pra- best Practices Show podcast. I'm your host, Kirk Barron, to the number one podcast where you can find great tips, tools, you know, thought processes, just great conversation, how to create a better practice and better life. And we're so glad and happy you found your way here. I want to just congratulate you for showing up to a great community of people that just love learning and love sharing great ideas. And today you're going to love this because if you're looking at creating a comprehensive practice, I've got an incredible guest today who is not only funny as all get out, um, I was going to say something else, but he is also brilliant. One of the top speakers in all of the United States in great technical education, Dr. Josh Austin. I also have my good friend, Dr. Kevin Growth here. So you do not want to miss this. So grab a pen and hit the share button. You're going to absolutely love this. And this marks one of the important uh, podcasts that we have in our series with the Seattle Study Club. And we're going to be talking about symposium and just a continuum of great learning that you do not want to miss. So stick around for this. Now, Now, if you are here for the first time, I'm going to encourage you, wherever you listen to podcasts, whether it be iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, wherever, make sure you subscribe because every single week we're going to be bringing you great guests, great thought leaders, and I don't want you to miss out on that. Also, we take great show notes, so make sure you visit back here and you'll see we'll put in extensive notes. Anything that Josh mentions today, we'll have a link to it and other things and then how you can find him when you come back. But uh, I just want to welcome you guys. So number one, of all the things I do, this is probably one of my most favorite things. I get to learn and I get to listen to uh, great thought leaders like this. And Josh, today we're going to be talking about a comprehensive practice. But Josh, I want you to introduce yourself if people don't know who Dr. Joshua Austin is. And then Kevin, I want you to chime in here too. And then let's start down that road of why this is such an important conversation. Thanks for having me, man. It's always always fun to to join you. I just got back from my um, impromptu honeymoon in Sedona. We were couldn't honeymoon because awesome. of travel restrictions. And now, uh, we, we finally were allowed. So it's kind of continental United States was the only really place you could go. So we decided to do Sedona, do some hiking in Sedona and enjoy the, uh, energy vortices, um, <laughs> exists. which, which, uh, a- apparently are a-, a big thing there, which I don't believe in, uh, at all. Um, but it, it was, it was a great time. And so I'm, I'm kind of back in the practice and re-energized from all that uh, energy vortex stuff. So Well, and you educated me before we went live on vortices <laughs> versus vortices. Well, yeah, they, they call them energy <laughs> vortexes. They, they, this is something that they believe in wholeheartedly, these people that live in Sedona, sure. and they call them energy vortexes. And, and you would think if you believed in it that much, you would learn that the appropriate plural for vortex is vortices. Uh, <laughs> and, and apparently they've not heard that word before. Uh, and and my wife was getting irritated with how often I was correcting people, telling them vortices is the appropriate plural. So that's Learned the kind of guy that I am. I love that. that. That place is great, though. It's just a beautiful. You get enough energy just from the natural beauty of that. Yeah, that, I mean that's what it is. You know, you're at a. You, I think what that. it. Yeah, you're at elevation. You've just hiked six and a half miles, and and you're feeling a little lightheaded, and that that sort of turns into, you know, some sort of mystical energy or something like that. And it's like, yeah, you're hung over from the night before, you know, and, and your head hurts because you're at, at, at 8,000 feet. But uh, uh, it was, it was a, a, a good trip, but I'm a, you know, I'm a, a regular old restorative dentist in San Antonio, Texas, as I, as I like to say. And, uh, and Kirk builds me up probably way more than I deserve. So, yeah, um, now I'm going to say this. If you haven't listened to his podcast, you have to, because, and you don't want to have kids in the car, um, but, uh, you're just a raw, authentic educator. I love the banter with you. I love how you get us to think, and you're just a straight shooter. That's one of the things I, of the many things I appreciate you. I like the word authentic. That's sort of my personal mantra is to, is to remain authentic. And that's actually you know, something that rolls into this idea of comprehensive care practices, right, um, is, is the idea of authenticity. And, um, you know, uh, so, so I was asked to do this by Michael Cohen, uh, the, the, uh, the, I don't know what, Grand Poobah, Godfather, what do we call him? Of we call Seattle him the Study Godfather, Club. absolutely. Yeah, the Godfather of Seattle Study Club. Um, and, and he wanted me to talk about building a comprehensive care practice, right? Um, and, and so we'll talk about that for sure. And what I don't want anyone to think is that's that big cases is all I do, um, because that's not the case. I do a lot of single tube dentistry, like literally before this, I did two class twos on people, right? Um, and social media can help someone 
put out a narrative that all they do is big complex cases, right? And, and, and that's what I, I don't want people to think that about me. I'm, I'm a regular restorative dentist. I do regular dentistry. There are times that I am able to do bigger cases and I'm going to kind of talk about the frameworks and the practice that you build to allow you to do that. Um, but I think what happens is, is, is we look at our own practices and then we look at other people on social media and we think like, oh, that's all this person does is big cases. And this is, you know, all this transformational life-changing stuff. And I'm here doing a, a, a buckle pit on number 18. I must be a crappy dentist. I must be a crappy business person. Uh, and we start to doubt ourselves and we, we start to compare ourselves to others and compare our practices to others. And all that stuff is supremely unhealthy and it leads to some really unhealthy thoughts about ourselves. And so in, in an effort of, of massive transparency, it, like that's, it's not, you know, I'm not cutting a full arch of dentistry every day and I don't want anybody to think that I am. And if you're not like, that's, that's totally normal. Like don't start judging yourself or your practice based on that. Cause that's not how this stuff works. Yeah. I think this is a really important conversation. This comes up a lot because the guilt factor or, you know, you get a little bit depressed or you think there's this world of ideal. And when I first got started 25 years ago and you'd see these people speaking and they had all these accoutrements of success, you know, and, you know, all these other things. And you thought, gosh, you're just doing a lot of big cases, but that's not the truth. And being a young dentist, Kevin, you're a young dentist too, coming on the scene. That could be hugely impactful to just how you feel about yourself and your practice, right? Yeah, I can resonate with what Josh is saying is social media can be a great thing to connect people across the world. I mean, I've never met Josh, but I feel like we're friends. And that's a beautiful thing to be able to have that, that ability to connect. But on the other side, it can be a very dark thing when you're comparing yourself to what other people are doing because no one's posting about the buckle pits. Right. No one's posting about, you know, the time when a crown broke or a, a failure that happened in their practice because it's not a presence that people want to have on the internet, which is really, that's real dentistry. And that's really what we should be doing. But when you do post that stuff, yeah. it doesn't really get the rounding um, applause that you normally would like to see. So yeah. it's just yeah. easy to go dark. It really is. And comprehensive dentistry, that's also exhausting if you do that all day long, every day. So a case a month, whatever it may be, might be a yeah. good avenue for someone to start. So absolutely. Absolutely. Now I do want to say this, you know, Josh, you and I met through the Seattle study club. And so we're going to talk about this a little bit, but you know, if you haven't had a chance to get involved, part of the development of anyone who really wants to be in a great community and just get authentic feedback, you know, authentic learning and just meet some of the greatest people in the world, get involved in Seattle Study Club. And it's just a powerful thing. And so in the symposium, which is going to be coming up at the beginning of the year in 2021, if 2020 wasn't the greatest year for you, uh, it might be something you want to consider. I know I'll be there and you guys will be there, but I want to talk about this topic and and why this is so important. And, you know, you and Michael Cohen were talking about this particular topic that you were going to talk about today. Let's talk about why this yeah. is such an important topic. And then let's get into the details. Well, so, so, you know, comprehensive dentistry, I think is, is a goal that we should all have, right. And it's not so much because it's an ego thing for us, or it's a finance thing for us. Um, but it's, it's an option that we should give our patients, right? Our patients deserve to have the option for, for comprehensive care. And, and many of them are, are not going to say yes to that. And, and that's totally fine. Um, but I think they deserve the option of, of, of doing, you know, um, something more rehabilitative uh, for, their, for their dentitions. And, and so if you're not offering that, it's a disservice to, towards your patients. Um, I, you know, I talk with, with Rob Ritter and Bob Marges a lot, and, and they will tell you, and I would echo their sentiments that, um, what's more profitable to a dental practice, 28 crowns on a single patient or 28 single unit crowns. And I, I think there's no doubt about it. The 28 single unit crowns is way more profitable for a dental practice. So it's not always the most profitable thing. And this isn't all about profits. This is just about being able to offer the care that people deserve. And, and part of that starts with, um, a saying that John Coy said, which I, you know, you probably have, have heard and echoed before is you can't sell what's not on the shelf, right? Or you, you know, if you don't have that skill, that's totally okay. Dental schools don't offer it. You know, no one comes out of dental school being a supremely great treatment planner. Um, and so that's where CE comes in, right? And so that's why, you know, being involved with an organization like the Seattle Study Club gives you the tools that you need to be able to offer comprehensive care to your patients. 
Now, many people listening to this maybe are a member of Seattle Study Club, have been, have been to Spear or have been to Coise or have been to Panky or something like that. Um, and those are all, gr you know, great things. It's, it's I think, the idea of, of having a system and having a place where you can go after you graduate dental school to add these kind of things, wherever it may be, whatever fits in best with your personal philosophy, with your ability to travel and go to CE, whatever it may be, um, you know, have that. For me, it was Seattle Study Club because it came to me basically being a member of a local chapter. I had local people, you know, that were part of the club that I could lean on as mentors. Um, and it helped me really understand the bigger, broader world of dentistry out there. And so that may be different for somebody else. Somebody else may be better traveling off to Key Biscayne or traveling off to Scottsdale or Seattle or wherever. Um, but just having a framework and a system to learn that dentistry is step one. You got it. You, you can't sell what's not on the shelf. So you got to learn it first. And that's not easy. And it's always a, a, a you know a, a process. I mean, it will never end. Um, but I think being involved early is is a way to go. And so um, you know, get involved with something early on that can teach you this stuff. Yeah, but you don't often just find yourself there. <laughs> you know, I talk to a lot of dental students and like, oh my gosh, I just got to get out of here. I just got to start prepping some teeth. I got to make yeah. some money. And I'm yeah. like, well, you should thinking about continuing education. They're like, I've had enough of education. Sure. Like, you know, so you do you you know, and we all have spouses. You know how this works. Your spouse yeah. can only take so much of this yeah. and of you talking about your practice and the yeah. problems that you have. But it, you know, having a mentor. I don't know what I I'd be so I'd have a hot dog cart right now. If I didn't have a couple people that were invested in my future to say, look, you should probably think a little bit bigger about this and say, go that way. You know, um, but if you had a hot dog cart, your your mentor would be Abe Froman. The <laughs> of Chicago. Is he a real guy? I don't no, know if don't he's a real that. guy. OK, All right. so I knew exactly who Abe Froman was. We used Good. to make jokes about it. Good. Abe you should. If you don't know who Abe Froman is, you have some Googling to do and then some Netflixing to do after that. Oh, my gosh. And how many times have you said Bueller, Bueller, and people don't even know what you're talking about? That's yeah. when you start to date yourself when you're That's talking to younger dentists and they problem. just don't. Yeah. They're like, I have no idea what you're talking about. I quote Dumb and Dumber several times a week. And I have people around me like, I have no Break idea it. what you're talking about. So, all right. But let's get back to, you yeah. know, finding your way in comprehensive dentistry. Kevin, what did you find when you got out? Now, you're seven years out. You know, sure. was it an easy ride for you? Just say, oh, man, it's awesome. You just open your doors. Things start to happen. Patients come in and they have a lot of money and they just say, can you do this tooth and this tooth, right? No, I mean, things are going to happen. I think this is just the importance of having something like Seattle Study Club or some community that you can go to because when those things happen, it's important to rely on a mentor or people that can help guide you towards the, the path of, hey, I've been there. This is normal keep going forward, keep pushing ahead because you'll learn from these mistakes or you'll learn from these failures and it's going to make you better and better because yeah, you don't just go to these educational courses and all of a sudden become a comprehensive dentist overnight. It takes many practices of failures and, and moving along and, and having somebody to guide you and push you and, and coach you through this because that's the beauty of all this is that we're a community. And I think that's the best thing about dentistry is that for the most part, most people are not egotistical people in dentistry and we want to help each other. And we've all been in those shoes and we want to guide and help and support people going forward. So I love the whole premise of a Seattle study club or Koi, Spear, Dawson, Panky, any of those are great. And I think if you just get yourself involved in those, it's going to allow you to push yourself forward and learn from each thing you take from each course or each person or whatever it may be. Yeah. Now I want to brag about you, Josh, because I'm a little jealous. If I was a dentist, you know, you not only have great um, great relationships, but love and admiration for a lot of your mentors. I've seen you with Bill Robbins, and I, I've, I've actually interviewed you while you were in his practice. I mean, you get the opportunity with Brian Schroeder's, the Eric Rindler's, the Jeff Rouse's. I mean, heck, one time I flew to San Antonio, you took me to a crowded restaurant. They made a table for us. And all of a sudden, a few of these guys start showing up. So, like, it's pretty cool that you put yourself in a circle of great learning like this. And, um, you know, your approach and how you educate, I really think it connects with a lot of people out there. And it's super, super helpful on all fronts uh, when it comes to comprehensive dentistry. Certainly, no doubt. But my Seattle Study Club is amazing. And, and those guys that you mentioned are all great. And and But I don't want anybody to feel like it's, it's oh, well, you have to be in San Antonio to do that. Because I, I go to Seattle Study Clubs around the country and, and go to chapters. And, you know, they, they all have amazing clinicians who are there to contribute, to learn themselves, and then to, to contribute. And I'm never, you know, talk to a restorative advisor of a Seattle study club 
who said that they didn't want to share their knowledge with the younger people in the club. I mean, they're all about that. That's like, they thrive on that. And so, you know, it's everywhere. It's all across the country that the, the, the best clinicians are going to be a part of, of the Seattle study club. And they're there to, to lend their, uh, to lend their expertise. And so, you know, it's not just that I stumbled into the greatest Seattle study club chapter there is, they're all great, you know? Um, so, you know, there, there's, if you're looking and craving for that mentor, um, that's where, that's where the person's going to be, you know, you're going to find somebody there that you can learn from. And so that's, that's the key. That's the, the first step is, is like, is learning what to put on the shelf. Right. And then once you do that, then it's like, all right, the next few things are how to get your practice set up to where you can fit those patients into that framework. And that's kind of what comes next. Um, but the overarching thought is get involved with it, with a, a high level CE organization early on and stay to stay a part of that and find what, what fits best for you. And like, like I said, it's for me, it's Seattle study club. Um, and, and, and continue to do that and continue to go with that. Cause it's a constant evolution and we never master it. We never, you know, grasp everything. We're never there. It's, there's always work to be done. And what would you say to somebody that would get out of school and say, Josh, I hear you, but I just can't afford it. I would say this year, that's, n- I know times are tight. Um, and I like Seattle study club is not an inexpensive venture and dues are, ex- you know, dues are, are expensive. I mean, I pay, you know, $1,800 a year to be a part of it. I think in comparison to like where it fits in my life, that's a pretty small amount. Um, what gets real expensive Kirk, and you know, this is symposium. Symposium is an expensive meeting and it's expensive in the tuition is generally pretty expensive. Um, the hotel, it's never at like a day's in or a Ramada, like off of a highway anywhere. It's always at like a five-star resort. So hotel's expensive. And it's usually like a week out of the office, you know, for the most part, it's like a Monday through Saturday meeting. Um, every few years they'll do a Wednesday through Saturday meeting. And those are great because you can at least work for a couple of days, but it's, it's expensive in tuition, ex- expensive in hotel, and it's ex- expensive in lost production because you're out of the office. Mm-hmm. And this year that's not an issue because you don't have to be out of the office. The tuition is like dirt cheap, Kirk. I don't know if you've seen like what they're charging, but it's like ridiculously inexpensive for what you're getting and you don't have to stay at a five-star hotel. So it's like, if right. you want to get a taste of that, this is the year to do it. Yeah. Yeah. I don't even, you know, I don't know what the tuition is basic, but Josh, to your point, you know, it's always expensive compared to what type of a thing, but going out there and staying in an incredible hotel with dining that's way over the top, the entertainment, and also meeting the best clinicians in the world. I don't smoke, but I always feel like I should have a cigarette after this is all over type of a thing. Like it's, you're just like, oh my gosh, I've never had an experience like that ever. It's kind of like an out-of-body experience. Even with the education, it's not so much just the clinical, but it was the life stuff. I mean, the psychologists, the trainers, the um, the marketers, and the international, you know, piece of dentistry. Some of that stuff is just wow, just great thinking and the futurists. Um, it's all wonderful stuff. But like to Kevin, your question, you know, this is the year to do it if you're going to get exposed to this type of stuff and get involved. Like this is the time to to take this step forward. And let me say this, Josh, but about your steps, the first step that you're talking about is so important because by osmosis, you're going to learn more down the path, which leads to the next step. You talk about building a patient base. I mean, you're going to pick up a lot of things just by being in the room, you know, and listening to people talk. One of my favorite things that a dear friend of ours both said is this, a lot of you sit in your chairs on Sunday night and say, man, I can't wait until Monday. I am not one of them. And that's from the great Dr. Bill Robbins. He's like, my practice, I'll just tell you, Mondays are not predict. I hate Mondays. Tuesdays, I like them. And so it was so refreshing to hear that. And he also on the big stage said this, my practice is not full mouth dentistry. I got a few of those cases going. Yeah. And that was, I was like, That was so, I feel, I felt like the relief in the room just came down where people were like, oh, wow, this is, he's a real guy. Yeah. It's authenticity, right? Like that's why I'm so drawn to Bill as a mentor is because I'm a core value of mine is to try to always be authentic. And Bill is that Bill will never, never be issue. And so, you know, if it wasn't for Seattle study club, my relationship with Bill Robbins wouldn't be what it is. And so, 
if Seattle Study Club only ever gave me that, I would be forever indebted to it. So, you know, your Bill Robbins is waiting for you at your local study club. Um, and so it's just a matter of, of getting involved. And yeah, that check, that $2,000 check sucks, you know, um, but it's at, at like once it's written and I'm there in the meetings and the treatment planning sessions and the CE, um, you know, it's it's worth every every penny of it. Yeah, absolutely. So I think the sometimes it can be overwhelming though because you get so much information that it, it, it's just yeah. builds and builds and builds. Sure. What would you say would be advice to implement this stuff into your life yeah. and practice? So, so you, you're taking the first step and that's the starting to get some CE so you can learn that treatment, the art of treatment planning, right? The art and science of treatment planning is such a big deal. Like it's, there are books written just about that, right? So you're going to start that process every year treatment planning, interdisciplinary comprehensive treatment planning is the focus of what you're learning. Um, and then it's all right. How do you take it back to your practice? Right. Um, and that's difficult to do when your practice is set up for, um, regular, you know, average general practice stuff. Right. And so no one would, um, unless you have a massive trust fund, be able to just like, all right, I'm going to drop every PPO and just start doing comprehensive care. Like that's not really how that works. So, um, your first step, I think, is to start um, increasing the level of your comprehensive examination experience for your patients, right? Um, so you can't treatment plan it if you don't examine it. And so um, raising the level of, of, of how you do a comprehensive exam. And I think specifically incorporating some sort of visual aid in your comprehensive exam, because you can't communicate with your patients unless you can show them what's happening, right? And so in the old days, it would be radiographs and mounted casts and all that kind of stuff. And nowadays it's like, we don't really necessarily need all that, but you need imaging of some sort, whether that be camera photographs or an intraoral scan, one of the two, like you can't really execute a comprehensive, a comprehensive examination unless you utilize one of those two things, in, in my opinion. Now you can observe it all, but you can't echo to the patient what's happening without those things. Um, and so incorporating that into your practice. Um, that can be cheap and that can be expensive. It depends on what you want to do. So whether that's taking a photography course and learning how to take good uh, extraoral photographs and intraoral photographs with a DSLR camera, I think that's great. That works really well. That's what we did for a long time. Um, and now we've moved on to a little bit more expensive uh, venture uh, in that, but, but using our intraoral scanner. Um, so our intraoral scanner, we typically think about being a, uh, a tool to help us make crowns a tool to help us with Invisalign patients maybe, but we don't necessarily think about it as a diagnostic tool or a patient communication tool. And, and that's absolutely what it is. And so we scan every new patient every time with our, um, now we have an iTero 5D in hygiene. The hygienists have their own dedicated iTero um, and they scan every new patient every, every time. Um, and so I'm actually able to sit down and go through the scan with the patient. I'm able to show them where I'm able to show them occlusal grams. I'm able to show them a lot of stuff in a way that they've never seen it before. Um, and number one, that's a huge differentiator for my practice because every time a patient sees an internal scan, they say, wow, that's cool. Right. They've never had an experience like that before. Um, and then it helps me educate them. It helps them learn about what we're looking at. Like, I, you know, I, I don't necessarily think one scanner is better than the other, but I'm going to use the iTero 5D as, as an example. Like it has interproximal caries detection, right? So I can actually show them like when they have interproximal decay, right? I can show them um, the tartar lights up like a neon sign on an internal scan. So you can have those discussions with patients um, and not have them or not feel like um, you're just inventing things to tell them that are wrong, right? You're actually able to show them, right? So if a picture is worth a thousand words, you know, I don't know, an internal scan is worth, you know, a billion words, you know? Um, and so, so that's where, that's where it starts for me is, is increasing the level of my comprehensive exam. Um, and so that means, you know, it doesn't mean all that much. Like if you just give yourself 15 minutes for a comprehensive examination for most patients, you can do a lot in that 15 minutes. Um, and when I walk in, the scans are already up and done and, and all that stuff's ready. So incorporating either photography or scanning in your comprehensive examination, I think is going to go a huge way, um, in you seeing things and then getting your patients on board with what your findings are and what the next phase, which would be the actual treatment. 
Yeah, and let me ask both of you guys this question because in observing dentists for more than 20 years, yeah, it's important to be competent, to know all this stuff, but that's not where all of the magic happens. The magic kind of happens when you connect with the patient and you're just confident. Well, you can sit with a patient and just say, look, whatever we learn today, we're gonna be okay because I can think through these things. I think one of the things that people get a little confused about is it it's not really about the information the information is great when you get involved with study club or you go to a symposium it's really about the confidence level and you put the confidence and the competency together just being with a doctor who really feels confident and connects i think that's a huge part of this for your long-term mental physical and emotional health in dentistry don't you think absolutely and and that's why i you know i see enough second opinions from people who, who had a treatment plan at some other office and they come in and they're, you know, I, they typically say, I wasn't sure about it. And what that means to me is that the dentist didn't spend the time with them to show them all these issues, right? They just said, oh, well, you've got some wear on your teeth and this is what we're going to do. Um, and, you know, I, I, it became a self-conscious thing for me of like, I don't want anybody to leave this office and think that I was lying to them. So I'm going to do everything I can to show them and prove to them what they have going on. Right. But when you do that, you know, I, I, I think it brings a level of education to the patient that you're, you're willing to spend that time. You're willing to, to kind of prove, you know, that you're not trying to, to, you know, whatever, you know, make your next boat payment or whatever, all the jokes that patients make about us are when you give them a big treatment plan. Um, it, it just, to me, it kind of, it, it takes that whole fog out of it as, as far as like, you know, Hey, there's a chance that maybe there's some dishonesty here. Cause there can't be like, I, how can I manufacture all these images? You know, like here, you know, this is it, this is what's going on. And so it started with that for me, but then I started noticing that like, Hey, people were saying yes more, you know, I was getting more yes, uh, uh you know, to, uh, uh, patients agreeing to treatment. And it was like, it wasn't too big of a jump to figure out like, Oh, Okay, it's because I've shown them what their problems are and they get it. And once they get it, it becomes much easier to say yes. And then they trust you. You know, once they see that you're not lying to them or you're not trying to pull the wool over their eyes, they trust you. And trust means yes. You know, you can't get yes to a treatment plan unless there's trust. Uh, and so, so that's kind of where it started for me was spending that time to show them, you know, tell, show, do, you know, going back to like pedo stuff. Um, but doing the same thing with adults, like this is what we're doing. This is why I'm looking here. This is what I'm looking at. Here's the evidence, right? Um, and then once you do that, you know, you start getting more yeses to treatment um, and you start treatment planning more, actually. You know, when you actually take the time to sit down and look at that, you start treatment planning more dentistry and you get more patients saying yes to it. So I think that's a, a huge part of it for me is utilizing imaging um, in order to show my patients what's happening. I loved the last like four minutes exchange right here because everything was popping up in my head of like, okay, I can bring that up. Kirk talked about confidence. Josh, you talked about communication, building yeah. trust. Well, it's, it's easy to be confident when you can show them right there on yeah, like a 27 right inch monitor, you know? It's like really easy to be like, this is what's happening. See? And like that, it, it, it just changes your your tone with the patient it, immediately. You're, you know, like I, I love Chris Ramsey and Chris Ramsey likes to talk about like, verbal cue or non-verbal cues from patients. Right. And he's talking about like, are their arms crossed a certain way and this and that. And it's like, I'm not, I don't, no offense, Chris, I don't give a shit anymore because <laughs> I'm like, I've got the evidence on my side. Right. Like I, I, I know that what I'm showing, I know that they're understanding what I'm showing them. Right. Um, this isn't like a used car salesman thing where I'm like trying to pick up on all those little cues, you know, because I've, I've got what I need. I've got my backup, you know, I've got the cavalry behind me, which is a 27 inch high def monitor showing them, you know, a tooth blown up to 25 X that's show, showing them what their problem is. Right. So, um, you know, I, I just think it, 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 it can't help, but make you more confident because it's so much easier to illustrate a point or, or, or to, to treatment plan a condition. Yeah. If I was a young dentist right now, I'd go back and listen five minutes ago and read, re-listen to everything that was there because it's all there. But if I'm also a young dentist, I don't have the money to buy an Itero or a, sure. a no, I get it. So my, my advice would say, slow it down. Just, yeah. you don't have to rush through a five minute examination, take the time with the patient, because right. even if you devote that time and get to know them, you'll find more treatment to do and they'll have higher case acceptance because they trust you because you're not running in and out of rooms. And eventually that builds more confidence and all that comes with it. So 
Slow and it doesn't it down, have to be a scan. Be... I mean, if it, like yeah. if you can get pretty good with the camera, mm-hmm. you can be just as uh, equally as effective with with some DSLR photos. And I, I say DSLR, I, I see guys on some of the dental Facebook groups that are really good at taking iPhone photos. You know, they've got like the the Smile Line USA um, mobile adapter for their iPhone. You snap your iPhone in, and it puts like a little soft box on it. You, and I've seen people take some amazing photographs with their iPhone. So it's like, all right, you know, it, it's more about spending a little bit of time to take those records. Um, but it's going to make a dare. Like that's going to pay off. It's going to pay off in, in the stuff that you see, the stuff you treatment plan and the yeses that you get. So the, the, the extra five minutes invested there is going to pay off, pay off big time. So don't be afraid to invest a few minutes, a few extra minutes in your comprehensive exam. Exactly what you said. Slow down a little bit. Or yeah. call a timeout. If you could yeah. call a timeout and say, hey, these are some things I'm seeing. I'm noticing some changes here. You know, I'd really like to devote a lot more time to see. Absolutely. What I'm never happen. afraid to say like, we for a second like appointment. yeah, let me bring you back for a second appointment where we can really get into this. And I, and I always tell them where I can give you an hour of my time. Um, and, and, and I've never had a patient say like, no, I need it right now. You know, they're always cool with that. They get it because they've been to their doctor's office where they sat and waited for, you know, an hour and a half for, for, you know, a, a, a a basic wellness visit or whatever. Right. So, um, never be afraid to bring a patient back. I get literally the last new patient I saw before I came in here was exactly that. Like, Hey, you're going to come in, I'm going to do this little patchwork on, on this broken veneer. Um, and we're going to sit down and we're going to talk about kind of what our comprehensive plan is going to be totally cool. She's totally fine with that. Right. So never be afraid to do a second appointment. I love this. And it seems like the best practices we've ever seen, just follow a a few simple little disciplines every day and build on them. They create these neural pathways. Now I'm not a scientist, but they create these like channels for success where success leaves clues. And they go, I've seen this work before. I've seen this happen before. And so the complex ultimately becomes simple. But if I'm a young dentist watching this, Josh, and I'm like, buddy, you don't understand. I got like, a, I got a lot of debt. I got all this stuff. And I, I feel overwhelmed at times. And I, you know, I'm hyperventilating, you know, what kind of wisdom would you, yeah. would you share with me as, does this get a little bit easier? Does the thinking get a little bit yeah. easier? How do I get from this complexity to just a little bit better? I'm not looking for perfect. I'm just looking for a little bit better here. So here's, we talked a little bit about before we started, we talked about Admiral McRaven who was the um, president of the University of Texas system, which is a big job. Um, It's appointed by the governor, it's a big thing. Um, And and he gave this famous commencement speech where he said, if you wanna change the world, make your bet. And everyone's like, that's that's insane. He's like, no, like if you wanna change the world, start by making one fundamental change, making your bed. And if you make your bed, you do that religiously every morning, get up, make your bed, um, then that uh, shows yourself, shows, your, your mind and, and your brain that you can change and you can make changes. And so, you know, that's the, the first change that you make. That's the first step that you take, right? And every challenge is going to be a series of steps. The most important one is the first one. And so he talks about, you know, making your bed. Um, so we talked about like spending that extra few minutes in a comprehensive examination, slowing down just a little bit, spending a few minutes in a comprehensive examination. I think the next step is um, giving yourself And I would start with it as simple as this. Give yourself half a day a month on your schedule that you block out. Half a day a month. And in that half a day goes um, treatment, comprehensive care treatment. So you get somebody that says yes to an arch of treatment. You know, they've got some wear on their teeth and you need to open up their bite in order to restore their front teeth back to full contour. Um, That's going to take you a half a day to do that. So that's where that goes, right? That's where comprehensive care treatment goes. Um, Now you may say, well, great, but like, I don't have any treatment to put in there yet. Um, And that's a hundred percent true. When you start, you don't. Um, So what goes into that half a day is those comprehensive examinations. So, you know, if somebody echoes that they have some cosmetic concerns, that's where their new patient exam goes. Um, If somebody comes in through another route into the practice and you foresee that this person is potentially a comprehensive care patient, then you reappoint them for their full, you know, where you spend your full time with them an hour or whatever it's going to take to do all your records and whatnot goes into there. What also goes into that time is any time that you need to treatment plan a case. So if you need to do a virtual consult with an orthodontist or an endodontist or periodontist in your area, that can go there. Um, uh, and, and, you know, what I used to do is I would say, all right, so Thursday afternoons are my comprehensive care time. 
and it started off being once a month, right? Cause I didn't want to do it every week. That was too much, but it was once a month. And I told my front desk person, cause she would get itchy. Cause it would be like, there's a hole on that Thursday afternoon. Like we can't have that. So let's put crap into it. Right. Um, and so I would tell her like, Hey, if we get to Tuesday of that week, we get to Tuesday morning that week and there's nothing in that spot. I give you permission to put like a broken tooth or something like that. But otherwise don't schedule into it unless I tell you to. Um, and so that then became two half a days a week. That then became three half a days. I'm sorry, uh, two half a days a month. Then that became three half a days a month. And then it becomes a weekly thing, right? And then your Thursday grows into your comprehensive care day. And then, you know, it just starts to grow from there. Um, but you have to give it that time to start. You have to plant that seed. And so saying that Thursday afternoon or whatever it is, whatever half a day for you is your comprehensive care time, make it that time and then make your time during that time about it. So even if you don't have a patient there, go watch a webinar about um, uh, dental alveolar extrusion and how to treat it, right? What are the treatment options for that? Um, you know, sit down and go through your cases, go through your charts and and work on your treatment plans. Like really devote that time to, to your comprehensive care patients. And that time will grow. You will need more of that time. But the hardest one to mark off is the first one because first. you don't want, like you, we just have this pathologic fear of having a half a day that doesn't have any patients scheduled in it. So we, we like the, the thinking of our front desk person is if there's four hours that are open, the dentist is going to come up here and get into my business and start lo looking and rooting around through. So, so they don't want to do that. Right. So they just put anybody there, even if it's three occlusal adjustments two deliver crowns um, and, you know, uh, some other non-productive procedure that like now you've just wasted a half a day on non-productive stuff that could have been sprinkled the rest of the week. Um, and it was simply because we have a pathologic need to see a name in a spot. Right. Um, and so don't be afraid to have that spot open. If you do it and for the first three times that you do it, it's open and you're doing CE or you're looking through charts, totally fine. That's part of the process, man. That's where this thing starts. Um, so you've got to get uncomfortable. You got to get comfortable with having that like half a day, even if it's once a month where you don't have anything on your schedule. It's hard, man. That first one's hard. You know, that first one where you're sitting there not doing anything. It usually ends up not being the first one because you put the first one in like two or three months ahead of time. So you always end up having something there, maybe some consults, maybe some comprehensive exams. It's like the second or third one where there's just nothing there and you start to panic. So true. Um, and so you just got to get comfortable with that. And, and there's always stuff that you can do that will fuel the comprehensive care fire for the upcoming ones. Right. And then you just start growing it from there. Can you, can you talk about the importance of like a team around you for this stuff too? Cause I assume doing this type of work, you can't do it on your own. So yeah, that's a big it's, thing. it's interesting. So there are a couple guys around here in, in San Antonio. I'm not going to mention any names that, that fancy themselves like super dentists, right? Um, they're dentists that can do everything. So they'll do everything from perio surgery to any molar endo and retreat to apicoectomies to, I swear to God, they do a Lafort if, if the state board would let them. Right. Um, and that's fine. I get it. Like you did a cool two year GPR. Awesome. You learned a lot of cool surgical stuff. That's fine. Um, but that's not what I do. And, and I'm sorry, I don't care what kind of education you've done. Like there's no way to learn how to be a, a good comprehensive adult orthodontist in like weekend ortho courses. Like it just is not possible, right? Like I, you can take all the Invisalign courses and all the, the David Galler courses in the world and you just can't be as good as a good adult comprehensive care orthodontist. So you just have to have a team of specialists that you can work with. Now, if you place implants in your practice, that's fine. That's not saying that you don't still need a periodontist on your team because I see periodontally involved patients all the time that I don't have the training or expertise to, to, to deal with, you know, or to, to treat appropriately. So you got to have a team of specialists. Um, where I met my team of specialists was through my Seattle study club. I'm not going to sit here and tell you that only the best specialist, you know, the Seattle study club is the only place where you can find good specialists. That's certainly not the case, but it's easy when you go to a Seattle study club meeting and all those specialists are there and you can work on a case treatment plan and have all those guys in one room at one time and hearing from them, as opposed to trying to play like the, the telephone game where you're trying to contact all these people separately. And maybe there's a group text or there's a group phone call or, or something. It, just the, the, what Seattle State Club is fundamentally built upon 
is the idea of a, of a treatment planning session where all your specialists are there in one spot. So that th those are the guys that I work with or the guys that are in that room, um, mainly because it's easy for me because they're all there at one time and we can talk about cases when we're there. Um, and because I know that they're dedicated to this, right? Like they are, they, 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 they walk the walk and talk the talk. Like they're there spending their Tuesday or Thursday night, whatever, you know, as a part of the study club um, and, and, and proving that they are into this stuff. And so that's kind of where it starts. You, you got to have a team. Um, are, do I have some specialists that I work with that aren't in my Seattle study club? Yeah, absolutely. There's a periodontist across the highway here who is an amazing soft tissue grafter. Ed is Ed is is amongst the best at soft tissue grafting, and I work with him frequently uh, for for those things and other things. Even though he's not a member of my Seattle Study Club, um, but because he's really good at what he does, and he makes it easy for me to work with him, and he understands comprehensive care. So you know, it's going to take you some time to figure out who the people are that you need to work with you on. I, I always think, to me, this doesn't get talked about enough. Um, a lot of the specialists I work with refer me patients as well which is really great, which is really cool. Um, and so that's kind of how a good referral relationship should be. Um, and so, you know, part of that's developing that relationship though. And it takes time. You got to spend some time with these guys uh, and, and ladies and talk to them and show that you care and have discussions about patients and things like that. Um, but start building your team one person at a time. To me, like the most pivotal one is a orthodontist because in comprehensive care, like ortho is a big part of it. And if you don't have an orthodontist that understands adult orthodontic principles, smile design, airway stuff, you just like, that's something you, that you, it's kind of a deal breaker. Yeah. And it, I know you're orthodontist and all you have to do is spend one half day over there and go, I would never even try it's any of this. No way. It's just no way. Yeah. It's, it's uh, ortho to me is the, is the key player because ortho comes up so often in comprehensive treatment plans. Yeah. And so to have somebody who, who can close a deal, you know, who an orthodontist who can say, I know you want to do brackets, you know, I know you don't want to do that, but here's why we need to do it. And I promise I'll make it better for you and, 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 and whatnot. Um, having an orthodontist who can close those cases is, is an unbelievable asset. So, yeah. Now I'm really bummed because like, I wish you lived in, in town here. Cause I would spend a whole hell of a lot more time with you. And I know we only get you for a few more minutes and I have, I need like a, a whole other hour with you. Maybe we'll have you back for part two of this I'm conversation. Cause Kevin, I've got like four more questions and I know you got a bunch that you want to ask, but I know Josh, you got to run, but uh, I want to end with a couple things. You know, I think what you said is really important. It's very hard to be a successful hermit. You know, there just aren't any. And you can try, but it doesn't really work very well. And so you got to get involved with the group. Um, I want you to talk about, you know, again, just if you're looking for a place to go, if you want to learn a little bit more, just talk about the importance of being in a group symposium. Like if I'm still on the fence, what am I going to see when I get involved in this? Why would I want to go? Like, yeah. So when I look at the, this is Kirk showing a screen of, of the headshots of all the speakers. Mm -hmm. um, and it's just like, it's a freaking murderous row of people. I mean, I'm just looking at like some of the, the best people in the world. Um, um, I don't know why they asked me to speak there, um, but they did. You're a good and looking fellow up there. Spot. Look at that. Number two. Yeah, it's alphabetical. So <laughs> let's not get too carried away. Um, I looked at my slot and I'm lecturing at the same time as Galip Gurel, who's oh, no. probably the best restorative dentist in the world. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, like... Uh, it's fine. I'll, I'll take my medicine with that one. And, uh, it, it's always a, a little, a little dose of, of humility there when you see that, like, uh, it's like, you know, when friends was at its rage, like what show was opposite network when friends was playing? No, I one knows remember. everyone was watching friends, you know, <laughs> that's true. Yeah. So, <laughs> so that's, I'm, I'm like, whatever was on CBS when <laughs> friends was on, but it's fine. I'll take it. Um, it's just, you know, it's, it's, it's the most amazing clinicians and the most amazing communicators. Um, and, and you get it all together and you get it from the comfort of your own home. And I think you get it for less than a thousand dollars. Um, and not like $999. I think it's like significantly less than a thousand bucks. Um, and so it's just hard for me to, to, to like, that's just such a huge value. It's, it's not even funny. Um, and, and I always, you know, I love like in-person symposium and this isn't going to be the same as in-person symposium. You know, I get it, but it's the best we can have right now. But in-person symposium, there's nothing better to me than that Monday 4 p.m. spot. Because that Monday 4 p.m. spot, it's what I call the Kirk Barron spot. Um, it's like everyone's kind of tired from the end of the day or from the whole day, but then you need someone to like come in, like throw in 100 miles an hour like Mariano Rivera out of the bullpen. And then here comes Kirk Barron and he, he does his deal. But I have to tell you, man, there's like a new kid in town. 
It's 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 the Todd Williams spot now. Todd Who's Williams. That? Who's Todd Williams? He's like, he's throwing 105, man. It's uh, he's the guy that tells the story about like the gardener at the, at the four seasons in Maui and like the, the blind woman. And it's the oh, gardener. No, I do not know of this Todd Williams. You speak of. Yeah. He's the very bottom one at the end. He's <laughs> right he's, here. Yeah, oh, the, I know Todd, the, the trainer, the, yeah. the, the, uh, not the Ritz Carlton trainer, the other hotel, the four, I seasons. Think it's four seasons. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah he cool. makes, he makes references to RC all the time and how they're not the four seasons. Right. It's um, it, it, that spot, that sort of end of the day, first day. Um, there's only a few people who can pull off that spot, and Kirk is one of them. I, I long uh, to one day be in that that Kirk Barrett spot at 4 p.m. on a Monday. Or, you're or not giving yourself enough credit. Every time you speak, I fall out of my chair. It is awesomely entertaining, incredibly enlightening, and it is raw and authentic and I just, I can't appreciate you enough. I do have one more question because I know you have to go. Now, there's so many things I love about you, but one is that whenever some we interview somebody, you can always see evidence of the things that matter most to them. So I'm looking behind you. I can see the global diagnosis. I can see your lovely wife. And then I don't understand the Seahawks helmet. That doesn't matter. But there's a little bottle over there. What are you saving that for? What is that? Is that, a, is that like a, a bourbon that was given to you by a friend like a long time ago, and you're saving it for a special yeah. occasion. No, this this was a this was a gift. This is Blanton's. Um, Good stuff. This Ooh. was bottled in. This was bottled in twenty, but it was prepared in 1993. All Who right. gave that to you? I need um, to know. A friend of mine gave it to me. I I have this stupid uh, Facebook group. Um, that's just, it, it's, it's just a mess. It's called funny stuff for dentists and dental team members. Um, and, and, a, and a member of that group sent me that bottle of Blanton's cause they, they have a hookup, but apparently Blanton's is hard to come by. Um, and so, um, I, uh, I enjoy the Blanton's, um, very sparingly because I want to enjoy it. You know, it's not like I'm not going to mix this with some diet Coke or anything like that. So it's now, just, is it a bourbon? I don't know. Is it is it a bourbon? bourbon? Yeah. Blanton's bourbon. is a bourbon. Yeah. So okay. it's, uh, I guess a single barrel, um, it says it's the original single barrel whiskey, um, but it's got handwriting on the label. So that's how you know it's good. It's like somebody took the time <laughs> to like write, you know, what batch or whatever it is on there. So okay, um, here's the, here's the deal. As soon as there's a vaccine and we don't have to wear masks, I will share crack, the, the three of us are going to yeah. crack that. I have a bottle of mine too, so we can do a virtual tasting. <laughs> there we go. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> we so, don't have to wait that long. Yeah. Awesome. Now, Josh, I know people for the benefit of people li listening on iTunes. If I want to learn more about Dr. Josh Austin, how do I find you? Um, how do I reach out to you? Tell me more about yeah. how I get a hold of you. Um, social media anywhere at Joshua Austin DDS. Uh, if you ever search for me and I'm not there, it's not because I blocked you. It's because I'm pretty strict about taking um, at least three weeks of social media vacation a year. Um, and so I will just close my accounts for a, a, a total of three weeks a year. It's, it's, it's never consecutively. Um, I'll take a week here, a week there, a week there, um, the same way you would take a normal vacation. Um, so if you ever search for me and I'm not there, I'm on social media vacation, look for me in a week or two and I'll be back. Um, but you can, you know, reach out anywhere on there. Uh, Working Interferences podcast uh, on iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, Spotify, Podbean, any of those. Uh, it's it's on there. It's not for kids. Um, it's for mature audiences. We had a question this week where um, someone went to the dentist and in their goodie bag, there was a little bag of white powder. And they showed a picture <laughs> and they thought it was like something dental related, like pumice or something like that. And they showed the picture of it and it was very clearly like a bag of drugs. And so it was like somehow, oh you know, like either the hygienist or the assistant or, or the dentist, like apps accidentally probably dropped their drugs in the bag and like what, you know, what should be done in that situation. And so that's the kind of stuff that we deal with. That's pretty serious, but some of the <laughs> other right. stuff that you guys have is actually really funny. Just oh, questions. we made it totally not serious. Oh, I mean, come on. <laughs> okay, okay, okay. I just want to make sure. Yeah, make sure. yeah. No, it's 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 a comedy show, um, yeah. and it's a comedy show for dental professionals because this this job is so freaking stressful that at some point, like, you need something to laugh. And sometimes things happen in a dental office where all you can do is laugh at them, right? Yeah. I mean, we've had we've all had those, those weird situations. So we like to highlight those weird situations. And I will be the first to admit, if you have a hard day, just put it on in the car by yourself. I actually will. My drive is about 18 minutes home. I'll listen to it. I just laugh out loud. I'm like, I can't believe you guys. If you just listen said that. this week, you're going to hear me screaming about how the plural of vortex is vortices. <laughs> 
for about 20 minutes. Oh, buddy, you are awesome. I can't thank you enough. I know we're way over time, but Josh, you are just the best. We're going to be back again and again and again, over and over and over again. I'm down uh, anytime. I just appreciate you, brother. Can't wait till we all get together. And so thank you guys for listening. If you enjoyed today, just do us a favor, which I hope you did. Just hit the share button, share this with your friends. Uh, keep sending us suggestions for things that you want to see on the Best Practices Show, either with Josh or any other topic. And until we see you next time, keep watching the Best Practices Show. You guys enjoy the rest of your day.